Wow. I'm honored and grateful that you've come out tonight to listen to this presentation. As you know, the reason for this presentation is that there's a proposal on the table with Mayor and Council to build a 500,000 ton per year garbage incinerator in the city of Powell River. This is a wheelabrator incinerator. This, so these are the people that are trying to build this incinerator. And of course, this is not quite the glossy Photoshop incinerator photographs that were presented to our business community earlier this week. But this is a good representation of what they're trying to do. And we could very well see this on our waterfront if we allow this proposal to go through. They said, my name is Mark Biaggi. I've got a master's degree in science. I've been working in the environmental field for 30 years. My area of specialization is marine biology. But I spent eight of those years as a vice chair of the Joint Group for Environmental Cleanup in Mugga Creek in Sydney, Cape Breton, better known as the Sydney Tarpons. The Sydney Tarpons are the largest hazardous waste in Canada, if not North America. And we spent 15 years fighting for the environment there. And it took just about that long to shut down two incinerators that were built in the area to build hazardous waste and municipal solid waste. These companies are going to come in, and they've already started to come in, and they're going to tell us how wonderful they are. They're going to tell us this wonderful story about how clean they are, how sustainable they are, how absolutely environmentally clean they are. So I'm just going to debunk those myths by clearing the smoke and breaking the mirrors. Why? Because I've dealt with these people before, because I know what they're trying to sell, and I know how far they're prepared to go to do, get what they want. You'll notice that they're talking about waste and energy, not burning garbage. And if, you, and if you go through the industry now, you're going to find that they go to great lengths, great lengths, to avoid the word incineration, to call it gasification, to call it plasma arc, to call it waste to energy. They're going to call it everything except what it is, burning garbage. It's not green technology. They say it's green tech. It's, it's going to help the planet. I mean, goodness. But here are the studies. Here are the reports. This is just one of many that you will find on the Internet. Well, it, it finds that waste to energy incinerators actually put out more carbon dioxide than coal-fired power plants. Waste energy is a fancy and misleading name for burning garbage. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. And this is the fuel. As you can see, this is a mass burn stuff. This is, this is the kind of fuel that these incinerators use. And this is what we can expect to see floating up our beautiful waterfront 500,000 tons per year of it, that's what they say initially, but I'm sure that it's going to get a lot, a lot bigger if they have their way. And, this, and they, they were going to tell us that, oh, this whole thing is, is, is post-recycling, post no such way. Post-recycling would remove almost everything that they've got. The only thing that these guys recycle is ferrous and non-ferrous metals. Waste incineration is not making use of renewable energy. That's what they're saying. Oh, this is renewable energy. It's not making use of renewable energy. They're burning paper. They're burning plastic, glass. They're burning batteries and, of course, organic material. Now, if you go into this literature and you look at the overall statistics, you will find that if you are going to reuse, reuse, or compost what is found in common household garbage, you can remove about 90% of that stuff. In fact, in Cape Breton, in order to demonstrate this, we took 10 random garbage bags and we started separating it into reusable, renewable, uh, recyclable and compostable material and we were able to separate up to 95% of the content of those garbage bags. The only thing that we really couldn't do anything with were stuff like dirty diapers, and that is classed as biomedical waste. I want you to keep that biomedical waste in your minds because I'm going to deal with it again a little bit later. They're going to say that, of course, you know, they are serving the planet. 
In fact, what they're doing is that an increase and there's an increase in demand for waste. Why? Because these incinerators are very expensive to run and they run on fuel and they want that fuel. In fact, recycling is exactly what they don't want because it takes 95% of what they can burn away. So they increase the demand in waste. If you look at some of the stats in the, in the websites across the world, wherever there are incinerators, there is actually a decrease in recyclable rates. They're going to tell us that the pollution control devices in modern incinerators are safe. In fact, they are not safe for the communities. They're not safe for the communities. If you look at the information that was given to our business community, they talk about how they have been working for the past 37 years under the most stringent regulations, environmental regulations in the world, and that they're in good standing. <laughs> We're going to find out how good a standing they've actually have. Now, to be fair, and I am trying to be fair, they have spent a lot of money in developing pollution control devices. We've come a long way from burning garbage in 45 gallon barrels and they have spent millions of dollars in developing separators and filters and all these sorts of things but they, they still cannot remove the pollutants that come out of the stacks and these things are going to contaminate our air, our soil, our water and most importantly our food. What am I talking about? I'm talking about pollutants such as furans, dioxins, and heavy metals. I'm, that's all I'm going to deal with wrong. I'm not going to deal with some of the other gases because there's just no time to deal with them. But believe you me, there are a lot of other things that are coming out of those stacks that are going to negatively affect the health of you, your children, and this community. A lot of these chemicals, which I'm going to call them the principal chemicals, enter the food supply and they concentrate up through the food chain. What do I mean by that? I mean that this stuff is going to rain out of the air onto a field. In that field there's going to be a cow. The cow is going to go around, munch the grass, accumulate these furans and dioxins in its system. We're going to take the cow, get its milk, get its meat, and we're going to get whatever chemicals that cow has ingested into our bodies. In fact, I'm going to tell you what furans and dioxins are. Furans and dioxins are products of incomplete combustion. They're going to tell you, oh, you know what? We burn this stuff at very high temperatures and everything is destroyed. And you know what? They're right to a point. The temperatures inside the boilers can go up. I mean, they say 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit because 2,000 sounds better than 1,000 degrees Celsius. They go a little bit above 1,000 degrees Celsius. Let's be generous and give them 1,500 degrees. Inside those chambers is 1,500 degrees. I'm sure that all of you have gone out and camped. And you had a campfire and you take a log, you throw that log in the fire and whoosh, sparks fly up in the air. Same thing happens in the incinerator. The temperature inside that fire is very hot. The sparks are little bits and pieces of wood that continue to burn as they go up. However, as they go up, the temperature drops and they stop burning. In the incinerator, this is where these furans and dioxins are formed. Why? Because the chemistry of incineration is complex. When you take something and you burn it, you destroy it, you, you basically turn it back into its molecular structure. The chairs you're sitting on will wind up in an incinerator. This tablecloth, the linoleum, all of these products, wood preservatives, glues, stains, paints, they all have a variety of, of chemicals that make them up. All these chemicals are now released and they are given the opportunity to recombine in the stacks. This is where these furans and dioxins are formed. Furans and dioxins are sticky little particles. They do not like water. They're what are, are called hydrophobic, but they're lipophilic, which means that they like fatty tissue. So if it lands on your skin, it'll dissolve into your skin. It'll accumulate into your body. Dioxins and furans are some of the most poisonous chemicals known to science. They're persistent and they bioaccumulate. What do we mean by persistent? Persistent means that they do not break down. Nothing breaks them down. The Titanic is sitting 4,000 meters under the North Atlantic and it's being eaten by bacteria. 
A friend of mine, Dr. Blasco, went down there and he identified and he called them rusticles. When you see those photos of the Titanic and they got these things that are hanging down, those are actually bacteria that are eating the steel in the Titanic. Those bacteria cannot deal with these furans and dioxins. They are impervious to biological breakdown. And the elements don't break them down anyway. So they're persistent and they bioaccumulate. What does that mean? It means that when you take them in, they stay there. Now, as, as men, we have a problem. Because whatever furans and dioxins we accumulate in our system, well, we're pretty much going to keep them there and we'll probably die with them. Women, on the other hand, have an advantage. They can get rid of their furans and dioxins as soon as they get pregnant and the heavy metals. Why? Remember I told you these things like fatty tissue? Every, all of these furans and dioxins are passed down to that fetus through the placenta. How many women miscarry before they even know they're pregnant? A lot of them do. However, we have found that one liter of milk supplies the same amount as dioxins as eight months of breathing the same air as a cow. Remember I mentioned the cow? So if you were breathing that air, it would take you eight months to accumulate what, what we drink. And what do we give our kids for crying out loud? Milk. And, it, and, it, and this is just one example of a, of, a, of a product that we feed our kids. All right, in China, is an economy that is growing by leaps and bounds. I've been there, I've seen what they've done, and they're, they're growing, and, and they're really not paying that much attention to the environment. They're starting to pay for it now. But they have huge amounts of incinerators. Now remember I mentioned modern incinerators, and in the, in the, in the brochures, the glossy pictured brochures that they gave our business people, they talked about modern incinerators. This is a 2010, that's two, two, two years ago. The Chinese, shut down, or they, they actually, yeah, they shut down incinerators because they found that these were important sources of dioxins and dioxin-like compounds. Let's go to Japan. Japan has the highest concentration of incinerators in the world. Why? Because they're a tiny little island with a huge amount of people. They consume more than we do. And they can't afford a landfill if they don't have anywhere to landfill. So what do you do with it? Yeah, burn it. Now the Japanese, because of the, the pressures that they're under, have lower standards, health standards than we do in North America. For they will accept higher concentrations of mercury in their fish than we accept in North America. These guys shut down a gasification plant, burning garbage in Tokyo, because they found higher levels of dioxin in the working areas by five or six times the usual amount. Now we're talking about an incinerator last year. Modern incinerator, that's what we're talking about. Now we know that the Japanese actually had the knowledge that these people working in these incinerators were going to be exposed to furans and dioxins at certain levels which were acceptable to them. So this is not just any old incinerator. This is, this is a top of the line incinerator, okay? So the other sorts of chemicals that I mentioned are heavy metals. So what are, what are these heavy metals? I'm just going to deal with a few of them. We're going to deal with mercury, cadmium, and lead, and I'm going to focus primarily on mercury and cadmium. There are many others, though, that are, that are a part of this family of toxic elements that are cast out in the stacks and in the ash of these incinerators. Again, cadmium and mercury, the first level of exposure for a human is through the placenta. It's in the womb. These chemicals are attacking the most vulnerable members of our society, the unborn children. This is, this is just, it's insidious is the only word for it. It's the only polite word I can use in mixed company. These things cause motor perceptual and behavioral problems in the fetuses that survive. What does this mean? It means that the kids are going to have mobility problems. They may not walk properly. Maybe they'll have a tick in their arm. Maybe they just, they, they won't be able to understand or hear or see what they're trying to express or, or whatever. They're going to have behavioral problems. And they're going to be caused 
by the in utero contamination that they suffered with these chemicals. Why? Because these are neurotoxins. It means that they are poisons to the brain and the nervous system. But they've also been associated with kidney disease and there are direct links to lung cancer and there are direct, and, and we know, for example, that these, that cadmium affects the endocrine and immune systems. The endocrine system is basically our hormones. This is a key component of our lives. From the moment of conception to the moment of death, our bodies are regulated by hormones. Kids grow up. They go through puberty. Secondary sexual characteristics are developed during this period of time. And under the effects of mercury and cadmium, they're, they're screwed up. They're, they're poorly expressed. And then, of course, they affect the immune system. The immune, I mean, we all know immune system. I mean, this is how our body protects itself against pathogens, against environmental insults. But because these, these chemicals affect and damage these systems, we can't protect ourselves. We're, let's say that we're less able to protect ourselves. Our bodies are less able to protect itself from, from diseases that are coming on to us. The accumulation of mercury and cadmium has serious health effects that become manifest as we age. And this is a real problem. But interestingly enough, recently there's been a great big hullabaloo about mesothelioma. You've probably seen it on TV. Mesothelioma is what happens when you breathe in a lot of asbestos. The show that I saw had a whole bunch of older gentlemen walking into a hospital, and they were walking into the hospital once a month to get x-rays to see if anything had developed in their lungs. These guys were, were retirement age. They should have been out fishing for crying out loud. Yet they were in a, in a hospital room, scared skinny of what was going to happen. And then they showed the, the photos of the before. And these were young, vital guys, you know, big, strong, hulky guys holding up bags to the chutes. And the chutes are dropping all this asbestos, and these guys were covered in asbestos. They were tough, though. Ah, we don't need mass. This stuff doesn't do anything. It's inert, for crying out loud. It's good. It puts out fires. Well, the same thing happens with these diseases. And you know what the problem is, is that when you do get sick, and our kids get sick, and our great-grandchildren get sick, they will not be able to come back to these companies and say, you know what? We're sick because of what you put into the environment. How do I know that? Because it's happened in my family. My father-in-law got two types of cancer. He died of one of them. I got a brother-in-law that has prostate cancer, a sister-in-law that's got breast cancer. No, no history of breast cancer in the family. I've got another sister with scleroderma and, and multiple sclerosis. You know what they were? They were downwinders from the Sydney, uh, the, the uh, Sydney Steel Power Plant. And when we went and took a, just a, a sample of what diseases were in the Whitney Pier, we got a whole mess of these diseases. And when we went back to the government and said, hey, you know what? These diseases were caused by, they said, oh, wait a minute, you can't, you, you can't jump to that conclusion. Uh, you smoke, you drive a car. I mean, you breathe the air. How do you know that that, that that disease was caused by the stuff that I put out? Prove it. You can't prove it. But it happens. And we become casualties of these things. They're going to tell you, and I, I've got some handouts there. I don't have a lot of them, but there are some handouts there that tell you what these people were saying to our business leaders. You could practically live in the stacks, for crying out loud. You know, and, and, and you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's really good, and, and we destroy all this stuff. But these pollution control devices, as advanced as they are, capture some of the stuff, but they don't capture everything. What they do is they concentrate these toxins. They do not, I repeat, they do not eliminate them. And this is what they're trying to pass off. They don't say exactly we're going to 
eliminate them. But the wording indicates that here today, gone after we burn it. It does not happen. They concentrate these chemicals in the fly ash and in the bottom ash. Now, you could stand amongst a pile of garbage for an entire day. It's not going to be pleasant, but you're not going to die from it. Why? Because garbage isn't hazardous. It's not hazardous waste. But after you incinerate it, you create something that is non-hazardous into a hazardous waste. And if you want to go and check it out, you can see it. Canada, everywhere in the world, regulates the fly ash as a hazardous waste. I see some people here that have some of that knowledge, and they can probably tell you that what I'm telling you is true. It's a hazardous waste. For every four tons of garbage burnt, one ton of waste, of uh, hazardous waste is produced, of ash is produced. Can you say that one more time? For every four tons of garbage, one ton of ash is produced, of a hazardous waste. Now, one of the arguments that they come up is, ah, you know, like landfills. They still have to landfill this stuff. The difference is that because it's now a hazardous waste, it has to be properly done. The, the landfills are extremely expensive, and, and they have to be monitored. And believe me, it doesn't make any difference how well engineered, how many liners they put, how many bentonite layers they have in these things. They eventually leak, and they're going to make Dan's life a misery because he's in charge of drinking water. And they're going to contaminate our groundwater. Why? Because it's happened before. And it'll happen again. They're going to tell you about the bag house and the filters. And yes, they capture some of the stuff, but they do not capture all of the hazardous emissions, especially the fine ones. Like I said, the technology for capturing this crap has been getting better, but the technology that we've developed to detect it has also gotten better. And so now we're able to detect stuff as nanoparticles. Nanoparticles are really, really tiny. And like I mentioned before, when we're talking about toxicity of these chemicals, we're talking in parts per trillion. So I don't know if you understand what a part per trillion is. But I'm going to give you a picture. You take a drop of water. You divide that drop of water into 20 equal parts. You take one of those parts and you drop it into a volume of water equivalent to what you would find in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. That's one part per trillion. These hazardous materials are toxic to human beings in, say, 10 to 20 parts per trillion that we can identify. Now, after the presentation, there's a video. It's a 12-minute video, which is probably way too long, but I'm going to play part of it so you get the name of the lady and you're going to look it up in the Internet so that you get an idea of what it is. They're now looking at toxicity in the parts per quadrillion. And I don't even want a hazard trying to divide water up into that small a, a part. But these nanoparticles are so darn small that when we breathe them in, we breathe them into the deepest part of our lungs. And they're so small that they will pass through the membranes into the bloodstream. And you know what happens when it gets into the bloodstream? It goes all over your body. It takes it to the brain, to the liver, to the heart, to the kidneys, you name it, it's going to go there. And it they, they likes fatty tissue. Your brain is mostly fat. Some have more fat than others. <laughs> this is Dr. Paul Conant. This is the, you know, they, they can attack me and say, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking. This guy's done the research. He's a toxicologist. He's an environmental chemist. He's the bane of the incineration industry. And he goes around the world talking against incinerators, I'm trying to get them to come here. Both morbidity and mortality in large cities can be related to particulate matter. From traffic, from power stations, from industry, we've already, we're experiencing nanoparticles and we're experiencing the consequence of this. And asthma, bronchitis, uh, death from, uh, earlier death from lung disease and so on. Now, the important thing to note about this is that relationship, which is well established by Doherty and others from Harvard, gets stronger the smaller the particles. And so they looked at it first of all with 10 microns, then they looked at it at 2.5 microns. And I, I would project that if they look at it at, with uh, less than one micron, they're going to find an even stronger 
relationship. So again, a modern incinerator converts hundreds or thousands of tons of trash each day into trillions of nanoparticles. It adds to the existing load. But it's more than that. These nanoparticles are the most dangerous of any combustion source because they have the richest supply of toxic elements. All the toxic elements that we use in society, additives to plastic, are pigments, are batteries, and so on. All those toxic metals, lead and cadmium and mercury and thallium and gallium and all the other things that we use in our lovely products, products are eventually going to end up in incinerators. And when they do, it's those toxic metals uh, which are going to end up in the nanoparticles. Those nanoparticles contain neurotoxic metals, stabilized free radicals. Now, this was a surprise to me. I'd never heard of the term, and I never even thought about it. But we know that free radicals are devastating when it comes to human health. And I'm sure most of you out there have heard the discussion, from, particularly from natural health people, about the need for antioxidants. Eat your vegetable, kids. Lots of fresh fruit, kids. Take these tablets if you're not doing that. Get your antioxidants. Eat blueberries, etc. Now, what are those antioxidants for? They're for mopping up free radicals because free radicals attack the tissue and cause a host of degenerative diseases. That's what it's about. Now, we have the potential here if we are producing trillions of particles with stabilized free radicals of dramatically increasing uh, this damage. It will overwhelm our defenses. So I strongly suggest if they build the wretched thing that you take a lot of antioxidants. Now what they're going to tell you, the other thing they're going to tell you is that modern incinerators are very efficient at producing electricity. And in the, in the, in the, in the uh, brochure that they gave our business people, they talked about how in Canada we're all concerned about garbage. And you know what? That's true. We are. And this 80% of Canadians were thought that, that waste to energy was a good idea. And they were right about that too. Why? Because people don't know what waste to energy is. As soon as people found out that waste to energy was burning garbage, <laughs> that percentage dropped significantly. In fact, incineration is a massive waste of energy. What they're doing is they're saying to us, oh yeah, you know, we, you know, we're going to produce all this, all this energy. In fact, if you go back into the literature and you go to the, the facilities that are actually working, you realize that the claims that these people put out are highly exaggerated. They don't produce that much energy. This is the source document from where I got the following information. And here you see the materials that are used for incineration. Here you see what you get in terms of energy saving from recycling, and this is what you get when you burn it. This is the output. So the, the whole idea is, you know, we're talking about energy, right? So are we saving or are we wasting? And this is what you produce when you burn it. This is the number of, of gigajoules per ton that is produced. This is the number of gigajoules per ton that you save when you recycle, reuse, or you compost. And here you see 10 times, 10.9 times other plastics, PET, that's what makes plastics hard. Uh, I mean, newsprint for crying out loud. That's the cheapest paper we can produce. You still save 2.4 giga or percent of the, of the whole process by recycling it than you do by burning it. To put it in another way, here we have the recycling column in terms of savings, and these are three different types of thermal or incineration or, to put it bluntly, garbage burning capabilities. There's no comparison. So they're actually wasting energy. Why are they wasting energy? Because if you take that plastic, for one, that's, that, it's not, it's not renewable energy because plastics are made from oil. But you've got to go out there, you've got to collect it, you've got to process it, you've got to burn it, you've got to, you've got to manufacture it, you've got to mine it in the case of some of these metals. There's a heck of a lot of energy that goes into producing the fabric on the chairs that you're sitting on. It's a lot easier to recycle it. Now, I almost gagged when I listened to the whole process about how wonderful this thing was going to be for Powell River economy. These, these things are not good for the economy. 
They do not provide jobs. On the contrary, they have incredibly negative impacts on the economy. Tourism. Powell River is a beautiful community. We got lakes, we got ocean, we got mountains, we got rivers and streams, we got trails for crying out loud that are world class. Do you think people are going to come here to the garbage capital of the Sunshine Coast? No, no, they're not. Because you know what? People are going to oh yeah, Powell River, yeah, that's where we're burning all the garbage. They're not even going to take the circle tour. They're gonna, they, may, they may go to Egmont to go and see the Skookum Chucks, but they're going to turn right around and they're going to go up Vancouver Island. They're not going to come here. Wow, that's a real attractor. You know, immigration into the community, people are smarter now. They're a lot better informed. When I came to BC looking for work, the first thing I did was look at what communities had incinerators in them, and those <laughs> communities got crossed out. If I had to stay unemployed for longer than that, that was fine. I was not going to bring my family and my kids, and the kids were small at the time. There was no way on God's green earth that I was going to bring them into a facility or into a community that had an incinerator. The same thing happens with people coming into this community. They're going to say, oh, yeah, no, Powell River's where they burn all the garbage. Yeah, we're not going there. People remaining in the community, I've been talking to a lot of people like you, thank God. And a lot of them have said to me, you know, if this damn thing is, comes to town, I'm leaving. I mean, I was talking to people yesterday that said that to me. But then you know what, they, and then, then they get this kind of blank look on their face and they go, God, who am I going to sell the house to? <laughs> you know, maybe we should start listing it now. <laughs> you know, that's, that, you know... It's, it's sad, but it's true. Who's going to want to buy a house in a place where they burn all the garbage? Now, do you really think that this, I mean, burning this stuff, maintaining these incinerators is hugely expensive? In fact, most of these companies are almost on the brink of bankruptcy. Covanta is almost, or actually, I don't, I'm not sure if it actually filed for bankruptcy, but it was so close to filing for ban bankruptcy that people could taste it in their mouths because these things are so expensive to run. They're so expensive to maintain. And I want you to keep that in mind because it's going to come up a little later on. So what are they going to do? They're going to demand tax breaks from the municipality. Oh, my God, we've got to stay in here. We're going to save your community. We need tax breaks. They all do that. No different with this. There are no significant jobs created. They're talking about 65 jobs. The Burnaby incinerator, for crying out loud, which is supposed to, which is burning 250,000 tons of garbage a year, only has four full-time jobs. Four full-time jobs. They have the rest of the jobs they have are, are part-time. Part-time jobs. Mowing lawns, doing a few other good things. Like going into the boiler and scraping all the crap off the walls that, is, that has accumulated on there and has cemented on the stuff because that's what happens when you burn glass at those temperatures. It coats everything and you got to get it off. Incinerators are not affordable option for waste disposal. You want to create jobs, you want to make this community sustainable, you want to get it humming, you turn this community into a sustainable community. Right? Thank you. You turn this community into a community that's a zero-waste community, and I have to applaud the regional district because they actually have people working on this. Man, that's cool. So all it takes is for us to start thinking outside of the box. We start thinking out. There are creative people in this community. There are brilliant people in this community. And what I think, and with all due respect to mayor and council, what you have to start doing is listening to the community. And let us think outside the box. Let us help. We love this community. We want this community to stay clean. We want it to stay sustainable. The way that I, I, I love to see hundreds of families come in here with little kids. I mean, there's nothing nicer than you see a bunch of five-year-olds running in a park. But now I have talked to you about theory. Talk to you about the science. I'm going to pull it home right now because this is where it really hurts. So they said, well, you know, this contract with the mill, 
going to do it at the mill. So here's a Google Earth image. There's the mill. There's Townsite. There's Cranberry. There's a little bit of Wildwood, or sorry, Wildwood of, of Westview. And uh, they said, well, you know, mill property and all that kind of stuff. So I'm assuming that they're not going to build it right in there. I mean, that's you know, I, I don't know where they're going to build it, but let's, let's assume it's not going to be in there. So I'm going to assume that they're going to build it somewhere in there. And so I decided that I was going to put an incinerator there. And then I decided to take some measurements. Let's just do this for fun. How far are the various facilities, various communities, away from this incinerator? Can you see where your children or grandchildren are going to school? Can you see how far away they are from this incinerator? Can you see where you live? <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's right on your doorstep. But you know, people have said to me, ah, you know what, it, it doesn't really affect me because I live north of town. Or, or, or I'm not that concerned because I leave south of town. I even had one guy say to me, you know, I live in Westview. <laughs> so, so I decided to, to, to do what, what a marine biologist usually does when he wants to prove a point. I got a windrose. I don't know if you know what a windrose is, but a windrose is a meteorological tool that people use to study wind. And we used to use it to look at the intensity, the direction, and the, and, and the duration of wind. These wind roses are placed on a compass row. So you got the north, south, east, west, all those degrees. And the data that I'm presenting to you here, which is this white web looking structure, was taken from data collected over the past 30 years from the Powell River Airport. And so this is, what it, this is what it shows. Of course, the center is where the incinerator would conceivably go. And if it's 100 meters either way, who cares? You're not going to have any effect. So here we go. This is an east-southeasterly wind. And yes, we know that our prevailing winds are southeasterlies. This doesn't mean that the wind is blowing in this direction. It means that the wind is blowing in this direction. Okay? Slyamon's going to be downwinder, London's going to be a downwinder, all the people in Wildwood are going to be downwinders, and you've already heard what happens to downwinders. But you know what? You're not all downwinders, because here we've got a northwesterly, and we've got an easterly, and we've got a, you know, a, a, a southeasterly again. You know? What this is telling us is that everybody's going to get a dose of this stuff. None of us are free. None of us are going to get away scot-free. We're all going to be sucking on this incinerator gas. Now, the other issue that you have to look at, I mean, we have, I, I get the emails from David Parkinson with regards to sustainable food. Well, if you look at what the recommendations in the literature are with regards to growing food in proximity to incinerators, they recommend a 50 to 80 kilometer radius. Don't touch it. So what I've done is I've been conservative, and I drew a radius. This is 50 kilometer radius. So this is the area of influence, all right? It's got Campbell River, of course, all of Powell River, Denman Island, Laskiti. It's got Hornby Island. It's got Seashelt, Courtney Comox, the Comox Valley. But look at this. These areas here are the most productive shellfish farming areas in the province, bar none. And I told you what happens with chlorine when it mixes with mercury. Well, the oysters love that stuff. I mean, it just dissolves in it because they're filter feeders. And this stuff gets into the plankton, and they eat it, and they accumulate it. So we're poisoning our food. This, this stuff... We can't allow this thing to happen. Now, all right, let's say that I'm a little bit off the wall here and I'm being a little bit, I don't know, what do you say? Nuts. Nuts. <laughs> Paranoid. 
paranoid. Yeah, let's let's so but so let's take a look at who wants to burn garbage in Powell River. Like I said, th these people claimed that for 37 years they have been working in the most stringent regulatory regime in the world, environmental, and all of their permits are in good standing. These guys are wonderful corporate citizens. So who are they? Well, it's an American multinational subsidiary of waste management technology known as We Liberator, and their partners are a Spanish company known as Urbasa. All right, we're going to start with We Liberator. Here we see the, the source page for the Boston Globe. Oh, look, we got the Attorney General Martha Koch investigating We Liberator's Sagas uh, incinerator, which is one of those really good incinerators that they're trying to flog. Well, this is what it says here. The employee's lawsuit. Now, keep in mind that this is the employees who sued the company. The people didn't sue the company because the people didn't know what was going on. So here we go. The employee's lawsuit alleges that Wheel Liberator knowingly, illegally, secretly, and systematically allowed toxic pollutants such as mercury and lead contained in the ash produced by the waste incineration to enter the environment. It describes a series of alleged lapses at the plant, including a failure to use adequate amounts of lime to neutralize the toxicity of the ash, inoperable equipment that was supposed to help control air pollution, and a failure to treat runoff from the landfill of the property before discharging it into the Lynn sewer system. This is the employees. This is the people who knew what was going on. And so what happened? lawsuit went forward but I'm going to show you what happened a, a little later on this is when you do a, a search on wheel liberator and, and, and lawsuits and stuff you come up with this and as you can see there's 522 uh, incidents uh, with wheel liberator I don't think they're all related to the incineration process but but yeah these these guys are well known by the judges in the US this is the source page for the Winchester and when we take a look at the, at the details, we find that Wheelabrator Sagas and Wheelabrator North Andover, both of those incinerators have been touted and were put in the glossy brochures with the Photoshop pictures of the incinerator. And they both say that these things are just the best things since sliced bread. The one in the bottom doesn't. But anyway, you can see here that they settled for $7.5 million. This is the largest settlement in U.S. history. Now, do you think that the guys sitting down in the boardroom in Houston, Texas, would be willing to dish out $7.5 million just because they're nice guys? No. The reason why was because they were sued by the employees. And in fact, what had to happen was <laughs> that the employees and, and some, of the, some of the environmental groups that were touted as a bunch of roaring hippies uh, sued the Organize, the government organization that was supposed to be running the show and making sure that these guys were maintaining these environmental standards. Okay, So they settled out of court. And why did they settle out of court? Because of a very important semantic issue. Now they weren't charged and they weren't found guilty. They, all of these charges are alleged. And so they can say, no, we weren't, we weren't found guilty. These are alleged. And so now we find that, that it becomes a, a, a semantic thing. Now, the wheel abrader in Chalk Point, right here, isn't in the glossy brochure. But I want to point out something very interesting here. They investigated the Chalk Point plant for burning dirty residual fuel oil without the required pollution controls for, or, uh, for the particulate matter in violation of the Clean Air Act. All right, these guys burnt, they received and burnt 187 million gallons of residual oil. And in two and a half years, they had 1,430 separate violations. Wow, that's, that, I mean, uh, that boggles my mind. I'd love to have these guys living beside me handling hazardous waste. I wouldn't have to turn on the lights in the house. I'd be glowing for crying out loud. This, the, this, this one here was one mill, was one incinerator, okay? Th th this is, I mean, if I'm going to be politically incorrect, what they told our business people is a lie. 
It's not misinformation. It's an outright lie. These are the kinds of people that we, we kind of want to bring in and we're considering as, as patting them on the back and bringing them in. This is, this, is, this is not right. This is stuff that we find everywhere on the Internet. Now, uh, okay, that, you know, just the bad American guy, right? But let's try, the, I mean, the Spanish Europeans are more civilized and all that good stuff. Let's see what Urbasser does. Well, this is the source document, and uh, this is from a publication in Panama. And I'm sorry I couldn't get it any, any, any better, but it says, alleged foul play in the contract that the city had made with the Spanish company Urbasser Plotosa to take over management of the Cerro Patacón dump set and the, where they had the recycling operation there. Thank God it was recycling. But it's foul play. So they're not really playing by the rules, right? It's, it's, a, it's an act of corruption. Here is another source document, and this one actually I know about because I used to live in Cartagena, and I know how corrupt the mayor and council there were. And this is, this is uh, please, this is no reflection on, on the good people that work here because I really and truly believe that they're trying to do a good job, but the ones in Cartagena weren't. And here we see that there are accusations of corruption were flying around the city after the companies Urbasar and Asad were awarded the $125 million contract, despite the fact that the former gained the lowest rating from the evaluating committee and the same committee had disqualified the latter. So Urbasar got the lowest marks, the other guy got kicked out and they got the contract. Money talks. They bought them out. So let's take a look. I mean, this is, this is a, a source document in France. That was a source document. This is, this is the extract from that pipe. This is the translation, and this was not done by me. This was done by professional, qualified, Canada-registered translators. It says, three weeks ago, as revealed by Canard and Kine in the November 16 issue, Urbasser also became the subject of investigation in a corruption affair in the Road Delta District. On September 8th, the district chairman, Jean Noel Guerin, was charged with illegal taking of bribes, undue influence, and criminal conspiracy in connection with suspected fraud in government contracts. This is ongoing. This hasn't been settled yet. This is ongoing. Okay, so. Urbasser is a bad boy too. Well, let's talk about the parent company. I mean, you think that they, you know, these guys will toe the line. This is the source document. And here we see John Hork, former manager of waste management subsidiary, was fined $25,000 in jail for six months for bribing municipal officials in Fox Lake, a Chicago suburb. Under oath, Mr. Hork said that the bribe was approved by James DeBoer, president of Waste Management Illinois, who is now himself, in the next page says, under investigation. <laughs> Whoa. Okay, these guys aren't shaping up to be luminaries. Okay, let's take a look at, uh, at another. Here's the Connecticut Attorney General's Office press release, 2001, so it's not really that far. Attorney General Richard Blumenthal, the Connecticut Treasurer... Um, Treasurer Denise Lenapierre today announced a $457 million settlement in a securities fraud case, the third largest security class action settlement in the United States history. The Connecticut Treasury is a lead plaintiff in the class action suit against Hudson-based Waste Management, Inc. So, are, can we trust these companies? Are you prepared to trust them with the health of your children and your loved ones and your own health and safety, the safety of this community? No. Now, believe me, people have said to me, why are you doing this? There are, there are three basic reasons. Proverbs 31.8 tells me to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. I take that very, very seriously. Now, who are the destitute? Destitute are the kids in this community who don't have a voice. I'm glad you're here because I'm going to task you with some stuff in a minute. <laughs> it's the people who are too afraid to speak out. 
It's the people who don't care. Those are the people that I'm speaking for. I'm a scientist. As a scientist, I understand the biological and ecological impacts that these, that these incineration products have. I know how they, the chemicals are formed. I know how they interact with biology. I know how they interact with your bodies. And it's not right. And then, of course, I'm a resident of Powell River. I chose this community. I chose this community. The people I love live here. And I want to live here. This community is a beautiful community and it's worth fighting for. And that is why I'm doing it. I'm prepared to do that. I'm prepared to fight for this community. <laughs> and what am I asking you to do? I'm asking you to get up and to make your voices count. They're going to try to blow smoke up our kilts. They're going to hold a referendum. They're going to regulate what the question is. They want to have, in the, in the document that they gave our, our business leaders, they were talking about having an independent company come and do a poll to see how many people are in favor. Well, honest to goodness, come on. I mean, all these things are easily manipulated, especially by a company that has millions and billions of dollars. I, I calculated I just, just out of curiosity, I calculated what it would cost or what, what this company stands to gain. The lifespan of these things is about 50 years. They stand to gain about $3 billion. Those guys sitting in Houston aren't going to listen to us. Oh, you know, if we don't want them, we won't come. No, we're in for a fight. These guys aren't going to particularly listen to us. The reason why I'm really happy that you and that you are here is because you are the young people of this community and you are usually the ones that are never listened to. Yet you have an incredibly powerful voice. I want to ask you to talk to your, the kids in your school. Rile them up. I'll give you a copy of this presentation. I'll even go talk to you, your, your kids. I, I, wasn't a, I wasn't allowed to go in and talk to the schools because the school doesn't really want to support this sort of thing. It's, it's too political. A political is just a really good way of gagging people and saying, I'm not, not going to do stuff. You guys have an incredibly powerful voice. Use it. Because you can change. You can change this community. This is your community. I know that you're going to grow up and you're going to want to leave and that's probably the only thing you're thinking about. But you know a lot of you guys eventually come back. Because this is a good community to live in. Because it's a good, safe community to raise kids. It's a lovely place. I'm asking you to get involved. I'm asking you to do what you can. Talk to your friends. Inform them that this whole incineration issue is not good. Apathy is the way that we're going to get conquered. I'm asking you to get involved. I'm, I'm prepared to be the mouthpiece. I'm prepared to go and talk to people. I'm prepared to speak, but I need you to help me. I did not put this together on my own. There are people behind me that are providing me with information, that are doing the research, because I can't do it alone. This is not a one-man show. There are a lot of people be in, the, in, in the background, and I want to thank them for it, but I need you guys yeah. here to do this. While everyone's here, I just would like to say personally that I would like to be part of a coalition of starting a zero waste facility. We have all the people, we have all, you know, the, the will to do that. And if there's any people here that would like to join that and like to talk to, to council about that, I would love to be part of that. I am um, getting emotional. I was in Wildwood when all the toxins were coming through. I was a, a young bride there and I lived there for 20 years. And I had vegetables that we had fly ash on. I had emissions from the mill. And at the time, I didn't know what was happening. I had two miscarriages. I had a child that has an autoimmune disease. And I had my neighbors dying, my Italian neighbors, regularly dying from cancer. And I know now what that was, and I don't want that to happen to people here. I've myself experienced, you know, fatty tissue breast cancer, and we have bosom buddies here mm -hmm. 
and we want to see something positive for our children. So, thank you. One of the reasons, like, not many youth are here today, and my friends were here, and I'm kind of disappointed that they're, they left, but um, my friends and I, we love, like, we love Powerver. We, we want to take care of our home, right? We want to grow up here, and I think if, like, uh, me and Forrest, if we went to school, if we told everyone, like, how this affects us, how it just, how bringing something that brings such pollutants to our community could just uh, destroy our, our nature that we have amongst us. And I think um, the youth is like, it's, it could have a very strong impact amongst the community and it could change a city's decision and bring people together. So I was just saying and thinking that um. Like, we could bring it to the school. Mm -hmm. We could, um, like, and even though it's political, I think if it's amongst uh, a, a youth decision, yeah. right, yeah. Um, yeah. it could just change uh, how people view um, how political this is. But it's not just political. It affects us. Yes. So. Yeah. <laughs>